everyone. Welcome to Inglatopia's well, Facebook Live. Let's give it a minute. There's nobody watching. Well, it doesn't matter because it's recording and you can come back and see the link later. Um, so we want to... Today we're celebrating the launch of John's book, Adventures in Inglatopia. Woo! So... Um, do we want to do this as the teaser and then come back live on the dot, or what would you like to do? Yeah, we'll just chat about stuff until the because it's not. We started early to give people time to join the call. Yep. So, so if you're on lunch or yeah, you know. so we want to give a few minutes for people to join because Facebook does its its algorithmic magic. Yes, to... it's Facebooky goodness, and we've got our pot of tea brewing just off camera here, and so um, the plan today is we're gonna have a little chat about the book and um, John's going to read an excerpt and um, we're going to tell you how you can get the book. And at any time while you're watching today, if you have questions uh, um, to John about the book, about Inglotopia, just questions, um, please shoot them down into the comments and we will address uh, and take all questions at the end today. So that being said, um, we also ask for, um, pa please be patient. Um, mm -hmm. We, like so many of you, are um, doing this from our home today. And that means we have kids running around and dogs and cats. And yeah, the mail hasn't come yet today. Yeah. So our if our dog goes crazy, that's why, because he hates the mailman. So it's um, we're doing the best we can. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, Hi, Tony. Yeah, yay! And we Hi. see Zahara. Hi, Zahara! Hi, Zahara. So thank you so Hi, much Debbie. for joining us. Um, so we're going to like properly kick off here in about two minutes. Um, but until then, um, I guess we could talk a little bit about, you know, what we're brewing in our pot of tea. Yes. Uh, it's backwards. So it's... Yeah, right? There you go. We're having Cornish Smuggler's Tea. Uh, which we sell in the Angletopia store at store.angletopia.net. It's a um, it's a mild. I think it's more mild. I'd say tea. smooth. Yeah, it's a smooth. Tea. It's not like it's not like a breakfast tea or an Earl Grey where it's kind of like. Yeah, and it's I, it's usually my daily after lunch tea. This is true. I so can confirm. We haven't had lunch, but it's lunch time, so we're gonna have it now. Yeah. Um. Do you wanna? I sent you the link. Do you wanna share that on our Twitter, Facebook? Yeah. So and everything so people know that we're live. Absolutely, I can do that. I will make the tea. You want milk? Of course. Can't have tea without milk. Can't have tea without milk. What is he doing? Using our lovely London Underground teapot that we got from. I bought it as a present when I did the Prince William and Kate's royal wedding. You did. I brought it all the way home from London. You did. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the old tube posters. So. Hi, Anita. Thanks so much for joining us all the way from Arizona. Hopefully it's nice and sunny there today. Uh, we were hoping for a nice sunny day here, but it's really cloudy, so I apologize. The picture's dark. We literally have every standing light that we have in the house kind of going to try and brighten it up a bit so unfortunately um i can't get into our twitter at the moment so um mr I'll, anglotopia I'll if you'd like to to go ahead and share that out so our friends over at twitter can um can uh join us that'd be amazing so thanks yeah that is a really sweet teapot um it's, got, it's a whole set too. We just we're just not yeah, using the mugs. Yeah, it's got four cups that go with it, and it was a lovely gift um, that uh, John brought me back from the royal wedding um, because I wasn't able to go. Our oldest son, William, or Anglotopia Junior, as John refers to him, um, was six weeks old, and I just I wasn't. Neither of us were able to to appropriately uh, travel with him at that time. So he brought me back a really lovely souvenir, which I really appreciated. So, well, it's noon on the dot, so, so yeah, let's guess, shift into book I, Yeah, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you for joining yeah. us at our live stream. Um, hopefully more people will join as the, as the stream goes on. Do you have the book? I do. This is the book, Adventures in Angletopia. Let's, there we go. Uh, it is a beautiful 300-page hardcover. 
Um, nice this is approximately what it looks like. This is one of the first proofs. Um, it's changed a little bit, but it, this is mostly what it looks like. Do you want to talk a little bit about the proofs and if somebody wants to buy one and kind of before we really dig in yeah. here, kind of with COVID and what's kind of happened with that? Yeah, the book is available anywhere you can buy a book. So, so you if, can get it from an indie bookseller too yeah, if you that, want to. If you can get it from a local independent bookstore, we encourage you to do that. Just give them the title or um, uh, the ISBN number, which, we can, which we'll put in the notes. Which is this number down here. Yeah. Uh, that, that's right, there. right there. Yep. Um, so then um, it's the platform we're using to publish it basically puts the book everywhere. Um, the big ones, obviously, being Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all the big book, bookseller chains, but it's also in the supply chain worldwide for those companies. So, yep. if so you're if, you're in the UK, you can buy the book. Yep. If you're in Europe, you can buy the book. If, if you're um, in Asia, you can buy the book. Yeah, anybody, you can buy the book anywhere. Um, so it's a hardcover. It um, if you buy it directly from us at our online store at store.angletobia.net, it will come signed. A caveat with that, though, is that if you do that, you're not going to get it till later this month. Um, because of COVID, the, the the printer is delayed in, in getting us our copies that we were selling. So we're not expecting them for another couple of weeks. So yeah. if you are itching to read the book now, um, you can go to Amazon today and you can have it in a couple of days if you're a Prime member. Or um, you can buy two copies. Or you can buy two copies. You can buy one from John that will come sign yeah. and one Give, to read right gift. now. Um, um, and then we, uh, also today the ebook was released. So woo! if you have a Kindle or a Nook or your iPad, you can read the ebook. It's available on all the ebook platforms. When I checked earlier, it wasn't on the Apple store yet, but I don't know why, but it's pretty much everywhere else. Um, and so you can buy the ebook version as well. If you can, you can start reading it right now while you're talking, while we're talking, if you want yeah, to. Yeah, definitely. Well, um, I Hi, just, Rhonda. I, Hi, um, Pamela. Thank you everybody again for joining. Um, we're going to, the idea is we're going to talk a little bit about how the book came about. Um, and then John is going to read us an excerpt of the book. Mm -hmm. And towards the end here, we will take questions. So if at any point you have questions um, that you'd like to ask John about the book or about Anglotopia or anything British, um, we would be more than happy to field those questions at the end. So John, a book. A, a whole book, not a blog post, yes. which are great, not a social media post, a whole book. What inspired you to write a whole book, a uh, book? It's a lifetime in the making. Yeah, um, that's amazing. So, you know, I've been writing with Angletopia since 2007, full-time since 2011, but I've never really been able to do the kind of writing I've always wanted to do, which was write books. Um, we've written guidebooks and our slang dictionary and stuff, but those are very, uh, they're different than sitting down and writing. They're and, like brief entries, yeah, like tips. Yeah, create a deliberate creation like Notes from the Small Island or uh, Kingdom by, by the Bill Sea. By Bill Bryson. By Bill Bryson or Kingdom by the Sea by Paul Thoreau or like an actual book you'd find in the bookstore and pick it up and go, that I, you know, this is a book I'd want to read. So, um but running the business with Anglotees back in the early days when it was still a, a huge, you know, thing, like the business was the excuse that I hadn't sat down to write a book. We were just so busy with the business. Do that, that word, folks. Yeah, you know, excuse, excuse, excuse. Uh -huh. um, so but when we bought our house five years ago, things started to settle down a bit, and I, I was finally in the mind space where I thought, I think I'm finally ready to write a book, and. When I decided on a topic, I mean, because I have no shortage of ideas for books, I have a file on my computer with so many book ideas. But true story. Um, it's I had to focus something that would be that would in inspire me to write it because it's a lot of work, and you know, and also be fun to write and interesting, and also maybe learn a little bit about myself along the way. So, so we kind of know why you why you wrote a book. How did you decide on the, t so tell people about what the book is about and maybe how you came about choosing that particular topic. So uh, the, it kind of hit me when I was at the royal wedding for Megan and Harry uh, two years ago. And I'm sorry if our camera shakes, our cat is rubbing up against the table here. Our cat named McGonagall. Yes, after, you know, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. um, and she looks like McGonagall when she's a cat, so. 
Uh, anyway, I digress. Yeah. So I, I was at the royal wedding um, in 2018, and you know the number one thing I get asked by when I'm interviewed and when I when I get emails and on our Facebook page is why? Why am I such an Anglophile? And she's been asking this question, question. for almost 20 years. Uh, why, why do I love a country that's not my own so much? And I never really had a good answer to that question because it's, 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 I've been an Anglophile for so long. I've loved Britain for so long that I don't like, it's just always been part of me and I've never really, I never really knew why. And I wanted to know why. So my goal with the book was to answer that question. And so that w proved actually extremely difficult to answer. Um, Cause I've heard you try and answer that question a lot. Yeah. And, and more often than not, what's really funny is in, in our experience when talking to particularly to British press, everybody's always like, why? Yeah, why, why, Britain? You, why do you love our country so much? It's not as great as you think. Um, so I really, you know, and they say when you write a book, the, the actual writing the part is the easy part, which is not easy, trust me. Um, and it's the figuring it out and thinking of it all. And so I had to do a lot of soul searching, which is a, such a hacking phrase, but I had to really look deep within myself and in my own memory bank as to why I am the way I, that I am. And just answering some social media yeah. fans here. So don't mind us. Yep. Um, so it became clear. And then that that's, that's a topic I wanted to do is to figure it out. And so um, it really, the genesis of the book really came together in summer 2018 when I had the opportunity to join the Rural Writing Institute in the Lake District. Um, it was put on by best-selling authors Catherine Alto and James Rebanks, um, both amazing writers. And actually, Catherine has a book coming out this week um, called Writing Wild. Um, definitely check that out. Um, she writes about women in nature, and it's, it looks sounds really interesting. James also has a book coming out in September. Sorry, folks. And James is a... Is a runs a farm in the Lake District. Did sheep you give farm. his last name? Yeah, James Rebanks. Yeah, great book. Uh, the Shepherd's great Life, which book. is on the shelf somewhere behind us, and uh, he and Catherine partnered to create this Rural Writing Institute where they wanted to nourish a new generation of of writers to write about the the landscape and nature, and that's something I've always wanted to write about. And one of the things I love about Britain most is the landscape. And so I immediately applied and I was really shocked that they accepted my essay and they, I was able to go. And it was one of the most fulfilling weeks in my creative writerly life. Um, James and Catherine made, made the most wonderful collaborative environment where you could where we talked with the other classmates about what we wanted to write about how we wanted to do it we kind of all workshopped each other's ideas um, they had guest lectures from other authors who came in and talked to us about writing the process and the landscape and there were little courses where we you know did writing prompts and exercises and all throughout that James and Catherine really wanted to encourage us and 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 help us move along in our writerly thing and it was like the best thing that I could have on the trajectory um, of the book. Cause I, I arrived there with the idea that this is the book I wanted to write. And I left with sort of the fully formed idea of how the book was going to go, how I was going to write it. And I cannot thank my course mates enough because we all really, they helped me figure out how to crack the book and how to, what it was going to be about, how I was going to proceed with it and everything. And, um, so yeah, so then that's how, really how the process started. And so, then... So then let me ask you here, what was your favorite thing about writing your book? About writing the book? The book. The book. Um, I'd say it was the chance to be creative. Yeah. Because, you know, when you write a travel log, it's very perfunctory. This right here. So we can see it. Yeah. So if you are, if you're like me and you shop by cover... 
sometimes going, well, I, I, what did the cover of that look like? It's right there. <laughs> Wrong way. Okay. So, sorry. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. That was very rude of me. It was the, so, your favorite thing. It was a chance to be creative. Because when you write blog posts and articles for the website, in the magazine. It, and, and I try to have creative flair, but it's very perfunctory. Like, this is what we did. This is where we went. This is how you can go there. Like, it's stuff like that. So it's very um, it's, it's very different than sitting down to create a nonfiction work. And so it was a lot of fun to sort of stretch that creative muscle. And I'm going to read my favorite chapter uh, a little later and give you an idea of that creativity where... I, I could really experiment with writing, and I haven't really had a chance to do that in a long time, so it was nice to do that. What do you think your, do you have a favorite chapter in the book, or one of those that you were like, as you were kind of um, mapping out the book and things you wanted to talk about, did you have one chapter where you were like, this is already written in my head and I can't get it out fast uh, enough? I'd say there's two chapters. Uh, Which were they? The first, um, the first yeah. one would be... Um, I have a real, it's actually the longest chapter in the book. I apologize to any, everybody who's going to have to slog through it. It's 5,000 words. A slog. But I wrote an article about, um, about my admiration for Winston Churchill and how that is sometimes problematic in, in, in the current climate, but also how, why he means so much to me and why he still means so much to me. And the places I've been in Britain related to him and whatnot. And so that gave me a real chance to sort of just spread out 10 years of travel insights about visiting Churchill related places into one article and also connect it to, to our modern chapter, 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 dear, chapter. not article, chapter, chapter. chapter. Uh, the next one, I think my favorite, my second th or my third favorite, cause I'm going to read my favorite one later would be the chapter of railways to nowhere. Oh man. Uh, Guys, the thing with him and railways. I, I'm a I'm a big fan of trains in general. Um, you, when you grow up next to railroad tracks, that like you know, by osmosis. But um, when we traveled in Britain, I love the old steam heritage railways and so many. the the concept of the chapter is that that they're railways to nowhere because you you can't go anywhere on them other than back and forth on their small stretch of track. True and story. So, it's a good, I, I know I seem a bit cheeky here, and it really is a good conservation thing, but but I love but I, I love them. So that chapter is all about heritage railways and some experiences I've had and, and how really they're a microcosm of things that I really appreciate about Britain, which is appreciating heritage, industrial heritage, uh, volunteers taking something that was you know, that was derelict and turning it into something beautiful and, and things like that. So, um, yeah. Did you have any, um, so the book is full of, um, things that you love about Britain and travel experiences that we've had together, that you've had alone, that we've had traveling as families or as a family. Was there any, um, I, I know that we've had so many experiences, but have there been any particular, were there any particular stories or anecdotes um, that didn't make it into the book? Yes. Um, and I mean, because it's 20 years worth of travel. Uh, so it's the, not all going to be in there. There were 100 chapter ideas. I saw the list. This is a true uh, story. Uh, and more than 50 of them I started. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a secret. Uh, probably about a half a dozen of the rejected chapters have actually already been published on the website. Don't you have to whisper a secret? <laughs> As Anglophile vignettes that I've been publishing during COVID. Um, they're chapters that didn't make the cut. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot that didn't make it. And honestly, there's so much that a lot of it will probably make it into the next book. Um, there will be another. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah. So do you have a favorite anecdote? From the ones that didn't make it in the book? Yeah. Because uh, we don't want to spoil the book for those. Yeah, this one I haven't published on the site. It's um, my first and last pint. Oh, that's a really funny story. Um, it, yeah, it's... Um, for those who don't know me, I don't drink ever. Um, Zero. Like, doesn't drink. It, it's I just don't like the taste of most alcoholic drinks, and I just prefer not to. Um, 
there's more to it than that, but I just don't drink at all. Um, well, no, I, you should probably clarify. Well, I, it's, there's a history of substance abuse in my family, so I just prefer to avoid it. And so, um, but when I turned 21, that's a milestone, you know, you can legally drink and gamble in, in, the, US. in the U.S. and Indiana. Um, so being, having been to Britain three or four times by that point, we were, and you can drink in Britain. At yeah, 18. but in, I never, I never did. Um, I thought, well, why don't I at least try an alcoholic drink, but why don't we do it in a British setting? Why don't we go to a British pub? And so we, we journeyed up to Chicago, which is not a far journey, which is a, which for, well, for us now we're like an hour and a half, but back in then we were still in. Yeah. We Miller, were still really, we? yeah, we were still pretty close. Yeah, We were still pretty close. And we went, it was called the, the red line, the red line. And it's not there anymore. It's very famous pub in Lincoln park, supposedly haunted, like yeah, crazy haunted, but it's not there anymore. And they, uh, it is the most authentic British pub we was. was the most authentic British pub we've been so to. So we've US. heard. Well, I mean, when we compare it to pubs we've been to, yeah, in England at that time, at, at that, that time, time, it was the most like, authentic. There's a lot of because like, most British pubs here are not authentic in any way, and uh, but this one was as close as we could get. It and was so, pretty close. In all honesty, I mean, it was. And so we ordered fish and chips. Uh, Yum. And the barman who was English helped us pick the right pint. For him. Which was, I knew what I was drinking. Which was Newcastle. Was it? Yeah, Is that it, what it was? It was Newcastle. And I took one sip. <laughs> and it was vile. And the barman was amazing. The barman was like... Um, like, really into it. Like, we explained that it was his first pint. And, you know, like, he had not drank a whole lot and what would you recommend for a first pint and so like the barman was invested in getting him this right first pint so i had ordered a pint and john ordered a pint and the barman was so invested who drank both pints yeah. it's a great birthday true story <laughs> that was a rough train ride home so, but yeah, so that was my, I, I joke it, that's my first and last pint because, I mean, I've tried beer, other beers since, but yeah, I, and lager I just, and... I, it's just not for me. Um, and that's much, okay. much to the annoyance of my Irish coworkers. <laughs> that's okay. It's okay though. They understand. I'll, I'll, uh, what do they say? You'll drink, you drink enough for the both of us, I'll right? hold up the side for both of us. <laughs> No, so, not really, but but yeah, I, I'm gonna publish it on the website soon. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet. Yeah, but it was it, that was a fun experience, and that was, um, and that was actually a stateside experience. Yeah. So, um, but then I, I, the problem with that chapter though, when and this is an insight into the creative process, was that I have a chapter about pubs in the book already, and actually that's so the, good. That's the excerpt I published today on Angletopia.net. Go read it. Um, I think it's one of my favorites, by the way, because it evokes that feeling of being in a, it's, there is no place else on earth. Even when you go to an English pub somewhere else, um, there is no place on earth like a true, really good English pub, you know, where the flagstone floor has been laid, you know, has been worn down from, you know, generations and generations and generations of people who have you know, gathered at the pub as, as, and not just as a watering hole, but as the heart of a community in a lot of ways. And right. there is a really special feeling when you go into a British pub. And I think out of all the chapters in the book, that is probably my favorite. And it, I think it's my favorite because you've captured the feeling so incredibly well. Well, thank you. And when I was developmentally editing the book, um, shout out to Aaron Moore, who helped me developmentally edit the book, which helped really turn it into what it is today. Um, she writes for Angletopia in the magazine. Um, she's an American expat who lives in London. She used to work in the publishing industry. So shout out to Aaron. Um, it, she pointed out that I've got this great pub chapter. And I've got another pub chapter about how I don't, how I had a, not, not a bad experience, but I don't really like to drink. And so it didn't really fit when there was already a pub chapter. So it got the cut. And we didn't like one. He didn't want to smash. It, it. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah. And it didn't want to, it didn't fit in the other one because of what I was trying to evoke. So it just got cut, cut, cut. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'll have John read an excerpt here right around 1230. Um, I apologize if you can hear a chime in the background. Um, that is our washing machine going. So again, um, for those of you who may be just joining us, welcome. Today we're celebrating the launch of John's book, Adventures in Anglotopia, This Beauty, right back here. Um, and we're just we're just having a little chit chat about how the book was created and what the book is about. And um, you know, you can click the link and go back and catch the beginning if you're just joining us now. Yeah, and if uh, and if you are have a trigger finger, itchy trigger finger, and you want to buy it, yeah, go it's for to, sale today. Woo! Yeah, uh, go to adventuresinanglotopia.com, mm -hmm. um, and that you'll find the links to buy it everywhere. Um, yeah. And you can buy it from an independent bookseller if you want. Um, just grab the ISBN number. They can go ahead and order it from you. You can order it direct from us and today. And it will come signed. And if you leave a note, I can inscribe it as well. So keep in mind, though, unfortunately, due to delays with COVID, um, if you do order it from us, we cannot get it to you um, right away. We are still waiting on copies to arrive. Yeah, here. It, they'll be here. They'll be with you later this month. So, so hopefully, like fingers yeah, crossed. But if you want like, it now, get it from Amazon or get the ebook or an indie seller or an indie or, book, independent bookstore. They can get it for you. Yeah, wherever than wherever you feel comfortable buying a book from. So, so well, that's that's really exciting. Um, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, kind of the look and the feel of the book because um, it's got this really great picture, iconic yeah, picture of I'll Gold explain, Hill. I'll explain. Kind of the how. And we, the, Gold know. Hill is, and there's a whole chapter. Well, you know what that looks like, so yeah. show them. There's a whole chapter in the book about <laughs> Gold Hill and our relationship. And there's also a lot in our, with our relationship about this place, Uptown Cottage. Uh, shout out to Jane and Simon. I don't Woo! know if you're watching, but... It's uh, Gold Hill is a very special place for me. You can rent that cottage. That's why we're yeah. talking about that. And cottage. then it it became a special place for us. Really uh, special place for us. And it really kind of sums up everything I love about England in a picture and in a scene and in a place. And when you combine that with the experiences we've had, so it seemed. The, the most appropriate thing to put on the cover of this book, because really that's what this book is about. Um, it's not about the specific place, but it's about what that place means to me. Um, and there's a whole chapter on why that is. And um, yeah, do you, should, you well, should, I go, should I tell the whole story? Cause it's in the book. I don't want to give any spoilers. You could give the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a, if you followed Angletopia for a while, it's a story you probably already know. Um, but, but, you know, back in high school, I was in a in a Hobby Lobby, and I saw this poster. A hobby store. A hobby store. If you're not familiar. I saw this poster of, uh, of this scene, and I loved it, and it tickled my Anglo Anglophile fancy. And so I purchased it, and I put it on my wall next to my bed, and it kind of became like a talisman for me. It was... You know, when you're in high school, everything the world seems like it's going to end. Everything is terrible, and you know, you have you get depressed. And so I thought, you know, nothing I'm going through uh, can be that bad because one day I'm going to go here. It and, was on your wall when we met. Yeah, it was on your wall when we met. Yeah. And his, you know. And so it was like a motivation factor that get through high school, get through all this crap because one day you will go there and. Yeah, and so um, eventually I did go there with you, actually. Yeah, he took me. He, I remember we were we were just sitting around, and he was like, hey, do you want to go to London? And I was like, yeah, sure. Okay, let's go to London. Like, I never thought we would go to London. I just, I didn't think he would do it. And, like, he was like, okay. Um, that was a the last time later. she underestimated me. Yeah, I bought plane tickets for both of us, and I was like, wait, what? You did what? Yeah, and so... We were there and, in, London. in London, and I wanted to go to Gold Hill, but it's not an easy thing to get to when you're 19 years old and don't have a car and don't know how public transportation right. really and works. Right, really kind of don't know how the world and works. Don't know, really don't know how the world works because we, you know, we were like Jon Snow back then. We knew nothing. Ah! <laughs> Oh man! And what does that make me then? <laughs> Good grief! You're a grit. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! No. Okay. So he really wanted to go, right? And but then 
I don't know how to describe this, but I get like a malaise thing where I'm like, well, I don't want to go through all of the things he to do. He didn't want to call because it, back then you had to call yeah, and order the tickets for the train. Yeah, I just it was just it was like too much for me. So um, she grabbed the phone. Well, he was like, okay, you know, I don't want to do the phone thing and order the tickets, and that just feels weird, and it's a credit card over the phone, and I'm like, give me the phone. We did not come this far and to not go to your dream place. To not go, <laughs> like, give me the phone. And so we ordered tickets. Yeah, and then the, it was the next day, I think. And yeah. We, we went on uh, what seemed like a journey forever. Yeah, because we had a we had a we, bus. We, we learned what a, a railway replacement bus was. Oh, yeah, uh, it was a whole adventure. It was a whole adventure, and we eventually showed up there. And, in Gillingham, and, right? In Gillingham, which is the town next to Shaftesbury where Gold Hill is. And we took a taxi. And the taxi driver were, was like, you're yeah. from where? He was you're like, coming here, why? He's like, he was perplexed as to why we would ever come there. Yeah, like, uh, we, we experienced it a lot. We visit a lot of places. We do. <laughs> People were like, why are you here? Like, because it's amazing, that's why. And beautiful. And so, um, we, you know, he drove us to Shaftesbury. And when you get, when you drive into Shaftesbury, um, you don't see Gold Hill. It's It's... It's behind the it's town hall. It's behind the town hall. Around you have to go down an alley, and then there it is, and and then there it was, and we saw it was like, and, and it was like the it was like I had transported myself into the picture that had been on yeah. my wall for five years. Yeah, and it was a really powerful thing to witness, actually, and because the yeah. look on your face, I felt like I'd come home. Yeah, standing there was just it was it was an incredible thing to witness. And we'll have to find the picture and put it up. And he's 19, and he has this little sweet baby face. Um, no beard. No beard. No beard. Um, Hair. Yeah. yeah, well, you're 19. And, and what's really funny about that story is that we literally, we went, it was like early March or late. No, it was it, it was, was mid-March. It was like yeah, nope, mid-March. Because you proposed on that yeah, trip. Yeah, spring break, yeah. Not on Gold Hill, but. Uh, uh, but we experienced like every season that Dorset yeah. had to offer in like an hour and a half. I'm not kidding. It yeah. was bizarre. And we sat in the cafe at the top of the hill, had a cup of tea, and it was just like, couldn't believe that I was there. Yeah. Um, and we went back a few times and stayed at the local B&B. So it became a place that, great. that we what would amazing go. amazing experience we, we had there, too. Yeah, it became a place that, like, that's that became the default place we wanted to go because we loved it there so much. Um, and and it, I did, too. I mean, it, it, became, it was originally his place and very much your special place. But over time, it became our special place. Yeah. And then it became more special when um, uh, Up Down Cottage... Which is sorry, it's yep. reverse. So, um, I, they they purchased the cottage in 2006 and turned it into a holiday let. And it's so beautiful. You could stay there. You could stay on Gold Hill. You would stay where we stayed. Just and uh, one of the first things we did after Angletopia kind of started to take off was we went. And well, we won. There. We, we won, won the British Airways contest. British Airways face to face contest. Yeah, back in 2009. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, that was the most amazing trip, I it think. It was. It was whirlwind. It was whirlwind. I mean, we literally had like four or five days, and we, you know, we had gotten to a point, I think, that we had traveled back and forth enough to Britain, and that was our first experience kind of staying in a cottage of our own, of our, our own, if that, you know, where we're not, you know, where we could cook, and we, we discovered the TV show Peep Show yeah. on that trip. And the IT crowd and all well, kinds and, of fun stuff. And it was staying on Gold Hill really cemented it in our in my own consciousness that this was like my place. Yeah. Uh, because you when you're when you stay in the cottage, it's so quiet and you hear all the noise of the hill. You hear the rhythms of the day. There's a beautiful back garden with expansive views of the Blackmore Vale. Um, it's just birds, the bird, clip clops the, the bird of horses sound. going down the lane. Like, it, like it's, it's literally an English paradise and I want to be there every day. He does. Um, and that's the first place we're going to go when we can. When, yeah. When it's safe, when it's and... safe to travel again. And so, um, but it's now 1230. Yeah. So, so if you want to learn more about Shasper and Gold Hill and all that, it's in the book. 
it is, and you can go to the website. Um, there's tons and tons of articles about Shaftesbury Gold. Yeah, Hill, I've written cottage. I've written on the website extensively about our experiences at Uptown Cottage. Um, shout out to Jane and Simon. Um, and well, in the cottage, we should um, we should. My boss is texting me, taking the piss out of me on the Facebook Live. Hey, watch your mouth. <laughs> Not cool. I see you. You're watching. <laughs> yep. Okay. So John is going to read an excerpt um, from the book um, "Adventures in Anglotopia," which is officially for sale today. You can order it direct again from us if you'd like, but please note there will be a delay due to COVID. Um, we are still awaiting the books to come in. Um, people cannot read it if you move it. Okay, we're still waiting for our copies to come in. If you order it direct from us, it will be signed. If you have to get your hands on it today, you can order from any um, any bookseller. Um, we'll have it, and you can have it shipped. There's also an ebook. Um, you can find that at where can they buy the book? Adventuresinanglotopia.com. Yes. Okay. All right. All right so, so tell us about the the excerpt you're going to read real quick. All right. I'm going to read my favorite chapter. Um, or maybe an excerpt. It's not. Okay, um, it's not very long. It's not very long. Okay. It won't take. It will probably take fifteen minutes to read through. Um, and uh, you know, Britain is famous for its stately homes and grand houses and Downton Abbey and all that. And when we've traveled over the years, we visited a lot of them. Yes. Um, so many of them. So they of, all kind of blur. Oh, they all kind of blur together. Although some of them don't. Some they, of them definitely. They, they stick all out. kind of blend together, which is the device I use for this chapter, um, where I kind of write about my appreciation for stately homes. And rather than continue to explain it, why don't I read it? So Take let it me away. have a sip of tea, and we'll start. So <clears throat> I've never done this before, so just caveat there. Forgive me. Just take your time. Um. It's called The Stately Home. Your journey to The Stately Home starts with a long driveway that takes you far away from the local village with the same name. The driveway is a single track lane, possibly in need of maintenance. Occasionally, another car comes in the opposite direction and you both have to drive off the road slightly into the grass to let each other pass. There is no sign indicating The Stately Home is nearby. There are fallen trees on the grounds. Later you learn this is a part of their conservation management of the land. There might even be deer milling about, occasionally crossing the road and forcing your wife to shout, Deer! Then you round a bend, and there it is, sitting perfectly in the landscape as if it was planned, which of course it was. Green hills surround it. There's a fine grass lawn leading practically right up to the door with a small, tan gravel driveway that will crunch under your feet when you walk on it. You pause to admire the view, hoping no one honks at you from behind. You may even pull the camera out and snap the perfect picture of the grand old house sitting in the landscape. The house is Palladian, obviously, maybe neo-Gothic, or possibly a mishmash of many architectural styles, but probably Palladian, the minimalist classical architecture imported from Europe. The house is at least 300 years old, in its current form at least. The Palladian facade hides elements that are far older. Some say the house dates back to before William the Conqueror, you have trouble believing that anything can possibly stand for over a thousand years, but this is England. There are plenty of things that have stood for much longer. You continued along the drive until you get to the car park. It's what the British call a bodge job. Basically, a muddy area that was once grass, but has been worn away by the legions of visitors who have come to see this very famous house. Thankfully, you brought your wellies with you and your umbrella because it's raining. You park the car, shockingly, you have to pay to park the car, but you brush it off, thinking every bit helps keep the house in order. The walk from the car park takes you on a circuitous route, and you begin to think that you're being led astray. Eventually, you arrive at the swanky new visitor center, newly constructed using heritage lottery money and designed to blend into the landscape so it doesn't detract from the grandeur of the very famous house. You pay your admission, grateful, you got a slight discount for some reason because the full admission price for a family of four was almost 100 pounds. But you brush it off again, thinking it all goes to a good cause. You're let past the gate and into the gardens. The gardens are what the place is really famous for, but you're not here to see the gardens. You want to see the house. Still, the gardens suck you in with their sublime beauty. It's raining, but the garden is still in full bloom. Vibrant colors surround you. 
You follow the path and come to a lake man-made by the famous landscape architect with a name that sounds made up. They had to dam every an entire river to make this view, Arcadian. That's what the guidebook says. And you don't quite know what that means, but you soon learn that Arcadian means exactly what's in front of you. A man-made lake in a man-made landscape with man-made follies designed to look like Greek and Roman temples filled with fake statues of gods and goddesses. But it all works together. It all looks vaguely familiar because of all the famous films and TV shows that have been filmed there, seeking the perfect Arcadia for lush romantic period pieces. You follow the path around the lake, desperately seeking the house. You catch a chill. Conveniently, one of the follies has been turned into a cafe offering cheap cups of tea and biscuits. It's enough to warm your cockles on this cold and rainy summer day, or spring, or autumn, but not winter because the house and gardens are closed then. You sip your tea and admire the view again. What time is it? It suddenly doesn't matter because you're in an artificially timeless landscape and you don't want to leave. You look to your left and see the famous temple from that scene in that movie with the rain. Or you turn to your right and see the lake with the sexy man who comes out of the water. You look up and imagine an alien invasion coming from the sky. Hollywood movies sure find some creative uses for these grand old stately homes. Most of all, you remember feeling, you remember that feeling you had watching that perfect period drama for the first time. You sigh content that the place that you watched was real and you're there to share it with your loved ones or family. You've had enough of the garden and the rain. The sun comes out as you make your way to the house. The house is famous all around the world. It was on that one TV show that everyone was talking about. When you round a corner leaving the gardens, there it is, and you pause. Then you remember, you have to return to the concept of time because your tickets to the house are on a timed entry system to contend with the flow of all the people who've come from all over the world simply to look at the place. Thankfully, you're bang on time. And as you approach the house, all the scenes and all the movies and all the TV shows you've seen with the house begin playing in your head. Perhaps you start humming that iconic theme song. You enter the house and enter into an immediately disappointing entryway. It's not grand like on the TV show. And then you realize, thanks to the information in the pamphlet included with your ticket, that most of the interiors were filmed elsewhere on a soundstage. But it doesn't matter. You're still there, and it looks vaguely familiar. There's a fire roaring in the entryway. You suspect the fire is roaring the entire year because it's July, and it's still freezing in the house. Perhaps the home is still owned by the ancient family that has always owned it. Despite the decline of the British aristocracy, the privations of war, onerous death taxes, and generations of inbreeding, they've managed to hang on to the place. Or perhaps they didn't. And now it belongs to the National Trust, who try to maintain the house as it was in its long-gone heyday. But the family still gets to live there, in a small apartment of 20 rooms at the back of the house. The house is in a perpetual state of shabbiness. That's the way the National Trust got the house, and that's the way they'll probably keep it. Or perhaps the charity that now runs the house will keep it that way. Either way, everyone is well aware that the selling point of this house is that it never changes. It was reluctantly open to visitors on, stra on strange days of the year. As, co as a consequence, it feels like it's always filled with too many people. There is no guided tour. You're trusted to wander around on a set path through the house. There's a docent in every room, perfectly willing to talk your ear off about some obscure element of the room. Sometimes you let them because it's interesting. Sometimes you can't wait to get out of the room because the person is slightly worrying you with a nervous tick or a bad smell. You wish that wasn't the case because there was something interesting in the room, but you couldn't find it out anything about it. Every room is filled to the brim with inexplicable treasures, the detritus of hundreds of years of materialism and hoarding, a complete unwillingness to throw anything away. It could be valuable, or not. Every little element adds to the feel of the place and mustn't be changed. Even when the house is closed and the place is cleaned from top to bottom once a year, every item is cataloged, photographed, and meticulously put back into place exactly where it was. Everything is just so. The pathway leads you from grand room to grand room, then you go upstairs and the rooms become smaller all of a sudden. This is where the family lived, and you get the joy of looking at their toilets and their closets. And if you're very lucky, you might even get to see some vintage clothes or that someone sourced from a local charity shop. The house has the most remarkable smell. It feels at first familiar, then foreign. It's a combination of dust and mold and old other books. It's marvelous. Then you get to the part of the house that is less ready for visitors. 
the parts of the house they can't afford to restore because the family is too poor, the National Trust doesn't deem it worthy. Here you can see the real decay of long gone aristocracy, the echoes of a dead people. Then you find yourself on a staircase going down to the kitchens. The kitchens didn't used to be on the tour, but since the hits of several shows set in stately homes, everyone suddenly gained an interest. And so now you had the kitchen set up as they were in the past. Even the kitchens were grand. Wow, these people sure knew how to live. That is until their economic burden became too much for the local and state economy, and the house had to be sold off. At least it was sold off. Other places like this were simply torn down or blown up in a farcical spectacle that would never be allowed today. Still, the estate is a center for local employment. A landscape garden still needs gardeners. The house still needs maintenance men. There's an army of volunteers too, but a large number of people are still employed to make sure this house doesn't change. Instead of working for an absentee uh, lord with his own sense of entitlement, they work for managers who know how to maximize a heritage of national, a heritage asset of national importance. You come out of the kitchens and back into the open. It's raining again. You make the soggy walk to the stables where the cafe and gift shop are conveniently located. You have another cuppa. But this time, have a proper lunch because no grand day out to a stately home is complete without an ethically sourced local meal. You're tempted by the honesty secondhand bookshop at the back of the stables. You hope to find a moldy old book that perhaps might have once belonged to the house library, but most are just books nobody wanted anymore and didn't have the heart to throw away and so they just donated to the local charity shop. As you survey the house and think about it, you imagine yourself living in it. Despite being a place of great wealth, it has a feeling about it that it could be just quite achievable, even if you're a middle-class American. It's easy to imagine yourself as William Waller Faster coming in to rescue the place from ruin. Of course, the idea is beyond silly. You'd have, to be an independent, you'd have to be independently wealthy to own and maintain a house like this. And even if you could, it would, be the, it would be kind of wrong to have it all for yourself. You look around at all the families and couples having a grand day out. This house now belongs to them. And, this, and that's beautiful, almost as beautiful as the house and the gardens and the landscape. Even if you only got to experience it for a few hours, you inhabited the place for a time. You finish your cup of tea, eat the last piece of chocolate cake, make the muddy walk back to your car, then go on to the next attraction on your list. A piece of you stays at that house. If you're in the area again, you know you're going to pay another visit because you can. From 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., weekends only from March to October, and one week before Christmas, at least. I love that chapter. Thank you. That is such a great representation of what it's like to... To visit um, such a beautiful place um, because there really is no place like it, like a, a British stately home. Um, oh, yep, yeah. let's don't get the computer. Um, so, folks, if you have been watching and you, and you've joined us and you would like to purchase a book, um, you can get the book again. Um, through us you can get it through any any bookseller um if you do decide to get it through anglotopia please do know that there will be a delay um due to covid we're waiting for our copies to arrive but if you order from us john will go ahead and sign the book and if you'd like to give it as a gift and have the book inscribed to somebody um we can definitely accommodate that as well if you have to have it today you can get it from amazon amazon your local bookseller, your local bookseller and um, an ebook or get the ebook and you can have it right now if you want yes. to. Yes. Uh, Such a good one. Yeah. So, um, time for questions. Yeah. We don't, there aren't if really anybody any, anybody has the, any questions yeah. about, about the book. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a question. Oh, here, here's more stuff. Oh, okay. Oh, let's uh, see. So I'll go through this. Why don't you tell me about what, what was your oh, favorite? Oh, someone wants to know about the Durham. Oh, that's a that's a good prompt. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. T Tony Hargis, one of our contributors, has asked. She wants to know about the Durham connection. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do, trying to find the, the root of my Anglophilia, was to trace my family's roots to figure out if. Um, uh, you know, if I had British heritage, and that maybe that was a part explanation of why I love Britain so much. 
And so thanks to the work of a family member, um, hi Aunt Missy if you're watching, um, we found that uh, on my dad's side of the family that they came from Durham or just outside of Durham in a place called Shincliffe. And when we did our drive from Lands into John O'Groats a couple years ago, we stopped by. We popped in. Oh, this is really <laughs> this uh, story. So I, I don't want to give too much of the story away because there's a whole chapter about it in the book. Yeah. Um, but it was extremely moving to visit a place that I had a tangible connection to. Yeah. And, and it felt, I felt that electric connection like this is where my people come from um shincliffe is a beautiful village you know typical just, english just houses, outside of durham just outside of durham uh, we actually went to the cottage um where my family is from and i think there's a there's a picture in the book do you write about how we found the cottage yeah we write okay. about how we found the cottage i won't spoil it it's funny though um, it's really i don't know there's a picture there's of a the picture of the cottage the um and yeah so it was it was a lot of fun to find a place that I had a connection to and so um definitely that's probably another one of my favorite chapters let's see anybody else spent the last 20 years in england very sad i won't be there this summer your book will help ease the pain sending good vibes from other anglophile my answer just came from salisbury oh thanks for the nice comment jill salisbury is lovely too yeah. it's we we do Salisbury a lot when we're when we're in Shaftesbury. Uh, hi Paul. So hi James. Thank you guys for. Um, oh hey there's Aunt Missy. Hi there's Aunt Missy. Um someone said they ordered it already. Um they also asked is there lots of pictures? Yes. Yes. Every every chapter has a picture heading. Um they're in black and white because the book is in black and white because it's. The color is too expensive to produce for us on a small scale, but you can see this is the picture that goes with the stately home chapter. It's, a, it's Durham Park in the Cotswolds, um, one of our favorite places. Um, the chapter's not about that house. That's about all stately homes, but right. um, it's uh, yeah. So there's a chapter for everyone, and and, and then is this? Is that it? Yeah, you're fine. Um, and then uh, and this week. I'm actually going to upload all the covers to the website so people can have them because they're they're neat because they're black and white. I don't usually post any black and white pictures. Well, um, and then why don't what are you hoping that people get out of the book? I mean, obviously it answers the question for you, kind of what is the source of your anglophilia, okay. but what are you hoping that your readers? I think from the book. This goes back to. Uh, there's, a, there's several elements to this. Um, I am a huge fan of Bill Bryson. Uh, for those not familiar with Bill Bryson, um, he is an American who moved to Britain in the 70s and 80s and ended up just staying there. Uh, he was there on a holiday. And when never, it was a lot easier. When to it do. was a lot easier to do that. And he never left. He married a British woman and they had a family and everything. And, and he wrote a book called Notes from a Small Island. Very famous. Which is which was a bestseller there and here. And it was really, uh, it's a meditation on Britain and all the wonderful things about Britain. And it, I read that at a young age and it really inspired me and really, it was really the impetus for Angletopia as well. I have all of his books. I've read all of them, even the ones not about Britain. Um, he still lives in Britain. And then um, it's, uh, so, I set out to write a book that I want to want to pick up off the bookshelf. And so Bill Bryson's books are kind of the template. I wanted to replicate the feeling you would get reading one of his books, but you know, obviously with a different voice and everything. And so uh, back at the RWI, Catherine and James said, told me something that uh, was probably the best thing, but also the worst thing you could say to me. They, they told me that I could be the next Bill Bryson if I really focused and really honed my craft. And so that's, that was, that's kind of my goal with this. I want people to pick up this book and get a unique picture of Britain through my eyes. And hopefully that they will, will share it with their Anglophile friends and get a enjoyment out of it. I got discovering Bill's books and bookstores. 
you know, myself. So That's awesome. So some, someone asked, um, let's see, uh, did I help you write the book? Um, um, no. Well, well, I mean, she didn't do any of the writing, but, no, but no, she's had to it. hear about it for the last three years. So she's been my workshopper on the book. Um, your she, ideal reader. Your, she's my ideal reader. She was the first person that read the book when it was done. I was um, the one that told him, shut up, sit down, and write. Yeah. Stop talking. Stop fiddling about right yeah. uh, and then and then you're you're in the book a lot i am in the book a lot it's dedicated to you it is which is so sweet i recommend everybody get a jackie oh that's jackies really are sweet. amazing that's really sweet um, um but you yeah. you support my writing efforts i don't write about britain i write something completely different but i learned through you how to support a writer and so that means copious, copious Lots cups of tea, of tea um, and making sure, you know, like how to care for the writer in your life. <laughs> like make sure they have good tea and biscuits and, you know, going, okay, you've been at it for four hours. Yeah, you have to do one lap around the house yeah. and then you can come sit yeah. back down. Leave them alone. Occupy the children. Yes. So, um, so, so while I did not write the book, um, th that was completely entirely key John. Key supporting role. Yeah. That would not exist without her. Oh, thanks, babe. So, thank you. You're welcome. Um, um, and then someone asked about... Um... um are we? Are we, do we have any plans to go back to Britain? Um, yeah, we it, always have. Plans we always to go have Britain. plans, and and we haven't been to Britain since 2018. Um, early, really early 2018. Well, September. September. For the drive, that was the last <gasps> time we went. Right. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. You know, things yeah. things were not great for Inglotopia at the end of 2018. Yeah, um, the business and, hit a rough patch, and so we we just weren't able to travel, and it wasn't appropriate to travel. Um, and then and we did a lot of travel we that did, year. Yeah, too, we did a lot so, of travel that year. So it's it was fine. So we're, family, we're, kids, career. we're on a break. <laughs> <laughs> Fans of friends um, will understand. But we're on a break. my my goal with the book is um, is to make enough money from the royalties because books are different than just selling something because you get the royalties like six to nine months later and everything. My goal with the royalties is to earn enough money to go back to Britain in 2020, assuming international travel is normalized and um, it's appropriate to do so. Yeah, we want to make sure that we can do so, so safely and responsibly. But we're hoping to go next year um, as long as... Um, it's appropriate to do so and I get, I get the time off of work and you get the time off of work and mm -hmm. um we really want to i when i was set out to write the book i wanted to finish it in up down cottage he did he had this um, beautiful dream of kind of writing the last chapter and hitting save for the last time yeah, in the cottage but that just didn't happen because of what was going on at the time when, well and covid and well this just... was this was a year and a half ago well, yeah, but you also couldn't but, go back and like do your yeah. final edit. Like so, there were definitely obstacles, unfortunately. So the goal with the book is to, since I couldn't do that, is is to use it to facilitate a return. So we're hoping to go next year. Definitely go back to, uh, uh, definitely go back to Up Down Cottage. Um, we have some other ideas that we want to we go back to London, and we just we miss it so much. It feels um, like our second home. In all yeah. honesty, I mean. I know that sounds so bizarre. How could you call somewhere where you don't live home? But, you know, if you, we've been very fortunate. And if you count the stamps in our passports, the British stamps, we have like 20 odd yeah. British stamps. I mean, so when you go somewhere 20 or more times, it feels like old hat. It feels like home. Yeah. You know, I think over 20 years of, of traveling back and forth to Britain, we have learned a lot of the cultural nuances i mean we will always be american in that we there are things that we will miss because we are just not born yeah. and bred british but as a whole i think we've definitely um learned a lot more about about britain and um yeah, yeah and just about british way of and, life and i have to collect the experiences so i can write the next book yeah, this is um, true. They're amazing. So someone um, asked... Uh, you, John's book. 
John, so someone asked about Bill Bryson's book. Yeah, which um, would you recommend starting with? And they are amazing, but give his give John's a try too. Yeah. I mean, really, I we're not knocking on Bill Bryson. He's amazing. But this is and I've read Bill Bryson's book and John has read all of the we've actually met Bill Bryson in yeah, Chicago. He's a lovely chap. I was heavily pregnant with Anglotopia Jr., our first child, and that was um it was a fun experience. Yeah, and he was great to meet. I hate to plug somebody else's. We're trying to plug our book, but yeah. Um, if you want to get started with Will Bryson, read Notes from a Small Island. That's his best known book. Um, I would then I would recommend I'm a Stranger Here Myself. And uh, in in his midlife, uh, he moved back to America with his family, and so he wrote about how America had was was like a foreign place to him. Um, and then. Um, after that, I would do the notes from Little Dribbling, which is like a sequel to Notes from a Small Island, and that way you, he like revisits a lot of what he wrote about, you know, thirty years ago, and gives more context, and also apologizes for mistakes he made in the first book. Um, and then his books about science and history are great. Um, you can't go wrong with the Bill Bryson book in all honesty. Or, or, or buy my book along with his book. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, so someone wants to know about your time if you if you've been to certain parts of the Lake District in the Dales. Yes, uh, I, I have been to the Lake District. That, that's where the Rural Writing Institute was held in 2018. So I've seen large parts of Cumbria. We were in Matterdale for the course, and then I also drove through the Hard Knot Pass. Um, the video from that. Is, yeah, there's a video on our YouTube oh channel. Gosh. I actually filmed the whole thing. So glad um, I wasn't in the with car a mounted camera, and you can see it's the steepest road in Britain. It was amazing. Um, so I've I've explored the Lake District. Um, we've only been to Yorkshire briefly. We went through. Um, we passed through Yorkshire on our drive from Lands and John O'Groats, which actually Yorkshire isn't on the traditional route, but we've never been to Yorkshire, so we wanted to go that way. Yeah. So what, like Downton Abbey is set in Yorkshire. Yeah. And... So we we stopped in York for a night. And then we gorgeous. Yeah. So, so we see. Did you do you write about that or no? Because uh, I don't want to give anything away. Uh, not in this book. Okay. So maybe, I just want to be in the next book. I just want to say, like, without like really going into it, going into it, there was this hotel we stayed at in York that was in an old train station, and like the old offices in the train station. No, it like the, it was the offices for the train company. Yeah incredible the most i cannot remember what exactly what the name of the hotel is but it's across kind of across from the actual train station amazing most amazing hotel i have ever stayed in just yeah so yeah so, cool. so yorkshire we love the north and we we didn't actually get to have it hadn't been to northern england until fairly recently so that's definitely a place we want to explore more. well we did we did the potteries this is the Midlands, though. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, folks. Still learning geography. Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. That's Midlands. But we loved northern yeah, we, northern England. We definitely Scotland want to go back. Um, absolutely so much I, to I, see and I, do. I need to go back. I actually write about this in the book. Um, uh, at the end of the Rural Writing Institute, uh, James and Catherine had us each plant a tree. Um, and, and, what a beautiful gesture. Yes. Yeah, so we had our own little patch of England and... There were tears when this happened. Uh, I cried, but, which is beautiful. But I'm at, not even I'm not even making. Fun yeah, of it. after the fact though, my tree died. <laughs> there there was a bad drought after we left, so my my tree didn't make it. Okay, so so, I need to, so you wrote a book instead. So so I need to go back and plant a new tree. <laughs> yeah, you do need to go back and plant a new tree. Um, but yeah, I I love my time in the Lake District. Um, it it's a. I love England's landscape, but I didn't realize that I was missing out on a whole more, much more beautiful landscape in the Lake District because there are mountains and lakes, and you don't have mountains and lakes in Dorset, even though Dorset's my favorite landscape. But um, it's, uh, yeah, I love, I love Cumbria. I want to go back. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, any more? We're gonna... Yeah, I think we're gonna wrap this up. We've been jibber jabbering on for an hour now. And we've had totally silent kids, which is either yeah, a really good thing a really or a really sign. bad thing. I'm, I'm afraid to end this. Um, so why don't you show our audience the book one more time? So, again, you can buy the uh, Adventures in Inglotopia at any bookseller. 
Um, just give them the ISBN number. Or the title. Or the title. You can um, get it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or... Kindle. Yep, if you want yeah. ebook, ebook is available today. Um, you can also buy it direct from us, but please note if you do, um, there is a bit of a delay right now due to COVID. Um, so we are awaiting our copies, but... If you do order it direct from us, um, John will go ahead and sign it for you. And if you put a note in the thing, I'll inscribe it to you personally. Or if you're sending it as a gift, um, just let yeah. us know who you'd like the book made out to. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and do you then, have any closing words that you'd like to? Yeah. Well, I want to thank everybody who's bought the book so far. Thank you. Um, you, the book has actually already been a success through the pre-orders. So yeah, we I'm, did better. Well, you did better. This is really you, but did better than then you know when you when you launch a book right it's a piece of yourself you're yeah, sending I, out a really I was really afraid. special piece of yourself yeah, there's a lot of me world. there's a lot of me in this book so i'd agree with that blood on the page <laughs> not really it's not violent <laughs> wrong kind of book john uh, uh but yeah so it's um uh thank you to everybody who bought one because it i already feel like the book is a success and so, but still keep buying them. But please. still, please keep buying please the book. Please, keep buying the book. I want to go back to England. Please. Well, and 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 uh, it it affirms that you know writing is something that you yeah, always wanted and, to do. This form of writing, and that's the thing is, this process was difficult, you know, through the whole thing. And I'm not going to be at all writerly about it, but launching it and having it feel like a success. What? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so funny. I'm not going to be all right or anything about it. <laughs> Launching it and then having it feel like it's a success is motivation to actually write the next one because I didn't. I was not 100% sure that I actually wanted to write another one, um, but I am going to write another one. So, okay. So, so Elizabeth know... Ruddell asked, it's Adventures in Anglotopia, The Makings of an Anglophile. My name is Jonathan Thomas. So if you search for that in any bookstore, you should be able to find it. Um, Hi, so... Art. We see that you've joined us. No, he he bought a copy. He was oh, one, yay! He, he, I think he's the one that got it from Book Depository. Oh, okay. Um, but I think that's all the. Oh, let's see. We got one more here. Oh, oh, right. oh, oh, someone here bought the Kindle version, so I can Yay, read now. Yay! Thank you. thank you, Jamie. Uh, what benefits you more, the hardcover or Kindle purchase? Um, as far as direct money in our pocket, the if that's if what you, you're asking, if you're that's what you're asking, if you buy the hardcover from us directly. That's where we make the most money. Um, if you buy the hardcover from Amazon, we still get a nice royalty. Or, but it's the royalty is the same whether it's the the print or the Kindle. Yeah. So whatever. So whatever whatever works for you. Yeah. If you're asking like, is it better? One yeah. Way if, or if, if you're asking which is the better place to get it to help us directly, buy it from us. Or which is the better reading experience? It's but it, for to read. yeah, if you want to read it on Kindle, then order it on Kindle. Whatever works for your reading, because our goal was to make the book available everywhere on every platform, so that how anybody could read it however they wanted to. Yeah. So. I think, oh my goodness, a lot more stuff comments. just keeps coming. So um, someone says, yeah, well, thank you for buying it from us. We appreciate thank it. You, thank uh, you. I'm sorry about the delay, but it just, we have no control over yep, it. Um, just COVID. But we were ready to ship them as soon as they get here. We, we have everything ready. We just we need are. the books. So, I actually haven't even seen the final book. Yeah, which is um, crazy. Because it, crazy. My, my copy was delayed, but... Um, so anybody who got it today on release day or is getting it tomorrow, you're going to see it before we did. Yeah, this is a true story. This is so, actually happening. Weird, weird, weird. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we want to say thank you again to everybody who took the time yes. um, to, to, to to listen. And I hope you enjoyed yeah. the excerpt. And I hope it you know interested you in buying the full copy. And I hope that anybody who watches this as Facebook will archive it. I hope that. Yeah, I was gonna say if you've joined late. Yeah, if you've joined late, you can you restart can watch this at any from time. The beginning, so we we started at noon. Yeah, and then we'll we'll upload this to our YouTube channel. Do you ship to England? Yes, I can ship it anywhere in the world, um, uh, but it, it will take a while. Um, so let's let's. You can, you can it'll ship anywhere in the world. Uh, we can ship it anywhere from here. If you order it, um, it's on Amazon UK, so you could order it from them, or you could order it from Blackwell's or foils or any british bookstore should have it um but if you want to get it directly from us we yes we can ship it to england um it'll, it's just, it'll, it will take a while to get to you 
So I think that is where we will end it. I think so. Thank you, everybody. Thank you please so much, everybody, for listening. And... and please get a copy. And thank you to everyone who already has. I've noticed a few sales come through on my phone. So everybody, thank you. <laughs> stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Uh... Curl up with a good book. Yeah. It goes great with tea and biscuits. It does. It does. So. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.